So yeah, we are going to talk about container gardening, which is a great option, you know, for many reasons, whether you don't have the space necessarily to, to, um, to grow in ground, maybe you, you know, have some uh, potential lead in your soil. That's a really common thing here in the Boston area. Definitely would recommend if you are in ground gardening, getting a soil test before you plan on growing anything edible. Um, lead is, um, you know, comes from paint or other construction. So the UMass, UMass offers a really great soil test if you haven't gotten it before. It's, it's pretty affordable. You send it in the mail. It might be pretty busy this time of year, but it's definitely a worthy investment. Also gives you a lot of recommendations of what amendments to add to your soil. Um, so that's a great option. But the great thing about container gardening is you have a lot more agency over um, what soil you're growing in um, and it, it, you know, and making sure that that's safe. Um, a lot of people do in-ground and container gardening. So um, it doesn't just have to be limited. It's, it's often, some plants actually grow better in containers, whether they like to be, whether they, you don't want them to spread too much or actually just the added heat of being in container can be helpful and it can just make the general weeding, you know, managing, it's a, you know, a little bit more of a controlled environment and you can put them anywhere. You can put them on your porch or on your roof. You can grow a tree on your roof as someone in the chat mentioned. So lots of great options to embark on container gardening. It's also often a great intro to gardening if, it, if this is a new practice for you. So I'm going to share my screen um, with some slides. Hopefully I'll be able to do a little bit of a live demo at the end of some of my containers. We're gonna see if my internet <laughs> works as far as my backyard. I'll do that at the very end. So if I lose you, you know what happens. Um, but I wanna show you my raised bed. All right, here we are. So yeah, feel free to ask any questions in the chat and Michelle can either answer them um, or relay them to me and we will hopefully have some time at the end. So there are many different types of containers and that's your first consideration in starting to grow in containers. So the main thing you want to focus on is making sure that they have adequate depth and space for your plants to grow. So when you get seedlings or you start with seeds, um, you think, oh, there's this nice little plant, they're gonna get much bigger and um, they're gonna have a lot of root growth and you don't want that to be hindered in a container compared to in-ground gardening. They have a arguably unlimited space, though often that's not fully the case. In a container, it's obviously limited. So the pot's diameter should be approximately the same as one third of the plant's height. So the width should be at least one third of the plant's height. Um, so that's like the height from the, the line of the soil to the top of the foliage. So that's one rule of thumb. It's not always, you know, every type of plant has a different amount of root growth. Some plants can do better in shallow pots and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Um, so yeah, so some, some plants have deeper root systems and some plants, which are often more slow growing, um, have shallower root plants so it can be a little bit more flexible for shallow containers. So just I'll say off the bat one example, um, though I guess this does follow the, the height rules is strawberries really don't need a lot of depth, their roots. I mean, when you pull them out um, or if you see the whole plant, you'll see that the roots never get that deep. So that's a really great um, shallow container plant, for example. A lot of greens like lettuce don't have very deep roots. Um, so that is one that doesn't need a very deep container. Whereas um, something like tomatoes or even a different kind of green like kale has a much deeper root system. Often you don't even grow those in containers because they really need a lot of space. Um, a, big, a big thing that is often neglected when growing containers is making drainage holes. Um, Sometimes you'll buy a container meant for growing, growing, you know, gardening, and it doesn't have drainage holes. And this is a problem because if it rain, you don't want your plants to drown. And and if it rains a lot one night, and you know all the water is just collecting in that container, um, it's just going to be sitting there. It's going to have nowhere to go, and that's not great for your 
that's not great for your plants. So it can be kind of challenging sometimes to drain to make drainage holes if it's a smaller, thinner container. Obviously, it's a little simpler. Um, sometimes you can, you know, sort of hit a nail in and make it a little bit bigger. Sometimes you actually need a drill bit or something along those lines to actually drill holes in your container. It's something to seek out if you're looking for containers to buy um, as something that you, you really want to make sure you have. Um, and then we'll get in, into this a little bit more later, but something else to consider is if you're growing edibles and you're, you know, let's say you're growing containers to avoid the, the lead in your soil, you don't want to have leached, uh, you know, plastic getting into your soil. So make sure you're using food grade materials um, for containers. Um, but there are a lot of recycled materials that are perfectly, um, you know, appropriate to use as, as containers. So one of the classic containers is a ceramic pot, um, which, you know, is a, you know, it's, it's one, one pro of it is it is really beautiful. It, you know, it's, it, it's, um, it's nice to look at. Um, it's heavier. It's harder to blow over. Um, and um, it can hold heat quite well. Um, but because, because it's porous, um, it, um, and it, so it, it, it does allow some level of ventilation, which is good for a lot of plants. Um, however, it will dry out really quickly, you know, because it, and it does wick out some of the moisture. So it will actually hold, like if you water your plant, it will take some of the water out itself. So you do need to water more often with these containers. And one of the major um, challenges with them is they can crack easily over the winter. So you, you, and you know, if you drop them or something like that. So you have to be more careful with them. Um, so definitely, you know, there's a picture of a succulent here. Succulents like don't need as much water. So plants that are a little bit less sensitive to drying out might be a better fit for this kind of container. Um, another, another kind of container is plastic. A lot of our, you know, a lot of the containers you, you go to the hardware store to get are made out of plastic or, you know, recycled plastic. Um, these are easier to clean than, for instance, the ceramic containers, and they don't lose or wick out moisture in the same way. Um, they don't offer any kind of insulation, though, and or, you know, at the same level of aeration. Um, they, they can be flimsy, they can rip, um, depending on how thick the plastic is. Um, but there is a ton of variety. It, it can be very customizable to your needs. Um, and then this isn't true of, of a, you know, that many, but, but especially if you're using uh, um, recycled plastics or thinner plastic pots, maybe you're using plastic pots that you got perennials in from a garden, you know, from a, from a nursery in past years or something, you, you know, you might not want to use it for years and years and years and years because eventually plastic can break down. It's not quite as durable. So here are some of you know my favorite classic plastic planters. <laughs> um, so one of them is a window box. So those are intended to sort of hang on the edge of your window. But I actually really love these, um, even if you're not using that. It it it's very you know you can fit it in many different places. Um, you can fit it on a ledge. You can you know you can tuck it next to other planters pretty easily. Um, this is great for those shallower plants I was mentioning. You'll notice it's really, you know, it's, it's quite short, um, but like strawberries or greens, um, something along those lines. You can even try to plant some like radishes or something like that in there. Um, but, you know, flowers, absolutely. Like, you know, some of the flowers, a lot of flowers have slightly shorter roots that you, you, know, you could grow nasturtiums or something like that in here. Um, and yeah, I think things, tend to do pretty well in this this container and, and I, yeah I just really like it um this is probably like it's not to proportion is not I guess we could pretend they're the same size but um this is a you know plastic planter one you know there's a lot of different kinds like this one thing you'll you'll notice sometimes and then I think both of these might have that is um if you're looking for holes in the bottom sometimes they have a separate compartment um that you can you can you can actually take it off if you want but but there'll be holes in this top portion of the container and then um, a little um, holder for water. So that's a way um, to have some level of drainage. It could overflow at times, but I think those are usually pretty effective. At, and that way, if it's like on your porch or something, um, you don't have to worry about having something to hold underneath. 
Um, whereas if you just are directly drilling holes or have holes in the bottom of the container, if it's on the ground, it's if it's on the ground, it's fine. But if you are putting it on your porch steps or something like that, you might want to have some kind of plate or something underneath to catch the extra water so that it's not rotting away the wood on your porch, just something to consider in the same way that you would um, with indoor plants. Um, and then another really great option, which honestly, you know, I think I honestly this season for my container garden, I'm considering just getting, I've experimented with, I experimented last year with some bags which really didn't work well, but um, the food grade plastic buckets, these are the classic buckets you see, five gallon buckets, um, you can get them at any, well, you can often get them in hardware stores and you're looking for the food grade, usually it says on the outside. Um, it's the size, if anyone has their compost picked up, that's typically the size you get of um, those buckets. Um, and, but the difference is you're gonna wanna drill holes into the bottom, which you wouldn't wanna do with your compost bin. Um, but these are great. Um, they're really good size. They're, they're pretty much you know, big enough for even the, the larger plants that are more soil demanding. Um, they're super durable. Um, they're easy to move around. And then like at the end of the season, they're, they're pretty easy, you can just stack them. So definitely a really great op option and just widely available and quite affordable. Um, but make sure you're looking for the food grade plastic. Usually if it's a planter, you can assume it's food grade plastic. Not always though. Um, and they can come in, you know, I know people have like giant, giant um, plastic containers. So that's another option too. Annabelle, I don't know, maybe you're going to cover this, but just to let people know that you can also find those at a lot of times like delis will get food, um, get ingredients in big buckets like that or Whole Foods has them. So you can also ask around if you want to try to find recycled ones. It's a great um, idea. Thanks, Michelle. And I don't, we're not going to get into this in this workshop, but I'm just going to put, I'll find and put a link in the chat to a, a workshop at the gathering, which was about building your own self-watering. I, I actually will talk about that. Oh, okay, great. Later. Um, so yeah, usually on the smaller scale, but, um, recycled containers, I guess that that's actually, that ties right into what Michelle was saying that you can find those, these buckets, um, these five gallon buckets, oops, what happened? Okay. Five gallon buckets are used often. They come with lids even for food. So, um, for like bulk food. So, um, you can find those. And then on the smaller scale, the containers that you're getting, at home can often be reused um, as planters. This often makes more sense if you're starting things, but for smaller herbs, you you know, or, or things like that, you can, or flowers, um, you can grow sort of indefinitely in these containers. Um, like on the right though, it looks like be, they're being used to start seedlings that might be transplanted into a larger container later. Um, but this is an interesting model of like water bottles that are cut on the side and then used to grow greens. I've seen a lot of like hanging container models with that um, sort of stacking the bottles. You can sort of cut the tops and the bottoms off of water bottles, like stack them and then cut out the side, um, grow something that, you know, is very hardy and, and willing to grow sideways. Um, but the thing you want to make sure of is that you're using food safe containers. I know I've said this a lot, but Yogurt um, containers are great. Um, those deli containers are the ones that you sometimes get soup in with takeout um, and are sort of uh, opaque plastic um, quart size containers. The plastic bottles like you see here, um, milk um, jugs, and then more rigid plastics typically are, are fine, but you want to avoid, um, which might actually, this might fall in that, in that um, category, but the um, solo cup type plastics, which are usually a flimsier, um, but if you are wondering, you can sort of look it up, but I think these, these are the types of plastics. You, you know, you don't wanna grow in sty styrofoam um, and then vinyl polystyrene. I think these are made out of polystyrene. I'm not quite sure, but, but you know, not every container is, is a good idea probably fine for a really short period of time, um, but it is something to consider. So that's plastic containers. And yeah, on the, on the note of restaurants, if they don't have these buckets, they often have smaller bucket. They might, you know, they, they could have a variety of different containers. I know I get yogurt in like a four quart 
um, yogurt container and that would be a really nice like deeper thing to grow something in. Um, I wouldn't use them for many years though. I mean, I think it'd be obvious they'll just start to fall apart and you do want to drain holes and make holes in these too, but you probably could just do that with scissors or something. So then fabric is, I, I feel like increasingly a way that people are really enjoying um, growing for container gardening. Um, they are often made out of recycled plastic um, and so, and typically they're BPA free. So they're, you know, food grade plastic and um, safe plastic. Um, and those are two brands, um, Smart Pot and Wally Grow. Um, so they're super lightweight. They're very versatile. Um, when you're done, you can just fold them up or you can even put them in the lot. But often you can put them in the laundry. I think there was like some question about that in a past workshop and someone confirmed that most of the, um, or at least like these brands you can, you can actually just put in the wash. Um, and so um, these are very um, porous because um, it's fabric. Um, so it's good for drainage. You don't need to poke holes in the bottom, um, but it will dry out very easily. That's like the main downside of these containers, but it doesn't have to, you know, if you have a really regular watering routine, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, I've, I've had a special success growing potatoes in them. So some of them you can sort of, they're meant for potato, they're like potato bags and you can um, roll them all the way down and you actually mound potatoes. So you like put them at the bottom and then once they start to sprout, you mound around the stem and it, and it grows more tubers sideways. And so you gradually unroll it and it becomes longer over the season. So that's a really nice feature. Um, yeah, I have a picture. It's hard to see, but these are, well, not the, this one in the middle, but these are grow bags, which is pretty amazing. Um, these look like three or four gallon grown bags. Um, they could be a little bit bigger even. It's, um, but these are, you can tell, these are really big plants growing these grow bags. Um, it sort of goes a little, I feel like those pots are a little small for the plants that they're growing in, but they seem to be doing pretty well. It looks like a cucumber, it even has a little trellis or a tomato cage in it. It looks like a tomato. So yeah, so as you can see, things are doing pretty well and it's pretty compact and looks like they might have some like plastic bags. This is actually from a, a gardener from our uh, Master Urban Gardener program, which we host twice a year. Um, and we had the opportunity, we asked people to share pictures from their container gardens and I've included some of those photos in this because um, they were really inspiring. So yeah, the bags, they're, they're great. I'm, I'm looking at this and I mean, I guess this is like a probably a five gallon bag. Um, yeah, and they've sort of tucked in a little basil and, and some Melissa next to the tomato. That's probably fine. Um, but yeah, you definitely would only want like one tomato um, in that size. And then um, the biggest container is, well, not necessarily, but often is a raised bed. Um, so this is a picture of a raised bed that's empty. And I wanted to show that because typically um, a simple raised bed is one where you just build a wooden frame um, and then you put landscape fabric down, which is sort of a water permeable, but not um, soil permeable, um, like piece of plasticky cloth. Um, and you put that in the bottom. Um, if you want to contain the soil, um, if you are using, or if you're not worried about the soil underground, you don't need to have a barrier. You could just have your raised bed on top of, on top of the ground underneath. You might want to like make sure there's not any really invasive weeds under there, but, um, but this is a great option if you are, yeah, you're worried about your soil, um, you wanna just grow above ground. Um, I have had raised beds on um, cement that have done incredibly well. It's still worth having, it is still worth having this um, cloth and often I like to have it sort of go up on the edges of the raised bed um, a little bit more. So it almost is like, a, it's like it's really containing the soil. So the soil isn't leaching out the bottom edge of the frame. Um, but yeah, the heat of the cement is really great and it actually like extends your growing season slightly. Um, so if you have a sunny spot um, on your driveway that's not being used, um, this is a really nice situation. 
Um, so yeah, raised beds, um, you can grow a lot, a lot of food in a raised bed. If you have a four foot by eight foot raised bed, which is admittedly quite large and maybe not your first raised bed, it's kind of a commitment, but you know, I've rented and built a raised bed for, you know, less than a hundred dollars and, um, grown tons and tons of food in it. Um, so that, that was really great. Um, and yeah, and often people will grow and raise beds even if they aren't, uh, even if they could grow in ground because it's just like a little easier to manage. Um, there's often less weeding that needs to be done, less encroaching grass, like right, in, you know, right next to your plants. Um, and it's really easy to add pest deterrents um, to this um, container, which I'll show later, like fences, or if you're trying to protect, you know, from birds or, or season extension. Um, and then I will show also a picture of square foot gardening is a technique of sort of thinking about spacing out your plants. Um, typically, um, we often say like it's, un, it's unreliable to find, if you look up square foot gardening, it's not always super reliable. They do often try to pack things in more, but it is a good rule of thumb. Like how many peppers could I fit, you know, how many, how many of uh, lettuce could I fit in one square foot? So sort of, a, you know, that amount of space. And, um, and so one thing you can do with the raised beds is you can actually just like mark out the square feet and it gives you a nice graph, whether you're following it exactly, it just like helps you plan a little bit. Um, yeah, so the wood construction is pretty easy. We actually do have a, a workshop that was from the gathering that's available on YouTube of actually um, youth from the food project will do a lot of raised bed builds for the Boston area and they led a workshop on how to build a raised bed and, and um, grow out of a raised bed. So if you want, um, you can seek that out. Um, but yeah, you can see some people build them out of pallets. You just once again want to make sure the wood wasn't treated. Usually it's written somewhere on the pallet if it was untreated wood because you don't want any anything getting in there and you don't want like varnished wood with anything that might leach into the soil or paint can sometimes be a little finicky, but, but typically, you know, the, the um, pallets won't last as long, but they're often free. If you want to get a harder wood, um, those will often last longer, um, you know, spruce or something along those lines, but often pine is, is fine. It'll last you like several, quite a few years before it starts to rot. And there's a lot of simple ways of, of constructing them. Um, the one thing to, to keep in mind, I think a lot of people are like, I'm going to build a raised, I mean, this is true about any gardening endeavor, but I think a lot of people can bite off a little bit more than they, um, can chew in terms of like, I'm going to build this raised bed. It was super simple. The wood wasn't that expensive. And then what you don't realize is you need almost like, you need like about a yard of soil <laughs> to fill this, if not more. Um, so let me think. Yeah, maybe a little more actually. So, so yeah, getting that soil, like that's not the amount of soil that you would realistically get in bags or it would be many, many bags of soil. It's like the kind of amount of soil that you would get in a pickup truck and shovel in, um, which if you have a friend with a pickup truck or you have a pickup truck, it's not so hard. Landscape Express sells yards of soil for like 40, $50, something like that. So, oh, um, you can get a compost soil blend. Um, we'll get into soil a little bit later. Um, so just make, you know, just make sure you're ready to like figure out how you're gonna get the soil to fill this thing. And it doesn't have to be four foot by eight foot. You could start with two foot by two foot and have a nice sweet little raised bed and still be able to grow a bunch of stuff. So that's an option. Um, here's that square foot gardening thing I mentioned. It's just nice to like have the squares, even if you're not following any specific guidelines, just to keep organized. Um, good example of how like trellises are really easy to incorporate into raised beds. And also like season extension, um, you can, ha you know, make hoops um, and cover them with um, clear plastic. And this means that you can grow even as the temperatures start to cool or this sort of fancier model, which has an actual lid. Um, this is another um, gardener from the Master Garden, Master Urban Gardener class. I thought it was interesting they use this metal. I, I haven't seen that many examples of raised beds like that, um, but it's an interesting, just like different idea. 
And um, another thing is like, if you're making them, this is very deep, like these are more shallow. Um, if you're making them this deep, you could fill the bottom with wood chips or some other, you know, some other um, mulch like substance. You don't have to completely fill it with soil because that is a lot of soil and eventually it will break down. So some other organic matter to sort of bulk it up. And you can do that with really deep containers too. Oh, this is me, I was saying I used to grow on cement and this is all containers. It's kind of like very full, it's hard to see what's going on, but there's, there's a raised bed in front of me and I just wanted to like show how much food is growing and how big this corn got um, in the raised bed, which was, I think it was sort of mutant or something, but didn't grow any corn, but it did grow quite large. So just a example of what you can do. Um, yeah, brief thing on self-watering containers, which Michelle mentioned before. Um, so it's a lot easier with plastic, um, but basically the concept that, you know, containers dry out a lot faster than if you're watering in ground. So you really do need to water once a day, at least um, in the warmer times of the year. Um, but let's say you're, you know, going to be away or you're not going to be able to water um, or you're just forgetful, like I'm really bad at remembering to water sometimes. Um, there's some ways of basically constructing your own or buying um, self-watering containers, sort of what I mentioned earlier, basically having a reservoir at the bottom. Um, and then you can see the little spigot in the bottom photo. You can pour water into the reservoir or in this ex very homemade example with two of those buckets, um, it has a little funnel made out of a water bottle to pour the water that goes into the bottom reservoir. And the premise is that then you're bottom watering, that the, the soil and the plant's roots are wicking up the water from below. There's some kind of um, sort of mesh or, or some kind of you know, whole, you know, permeable thing in between the two where the plant can get the water and then you don't have to focus as much on watering above this makes more sense when the plants are a little bit more established because imagine if the roots were really shallow, it's not going to reach the water at the bottom. Usually it's a little bit of both. You water on top and on the bottom, but it is a cool option. And we do have a whole YouTube um, workshop where a local gardener shows how she makes her own, um, which is pretty cool. She has like pretty intricate systems. Yeah, here's a picture of it on the inside. This you would pour the water in here and you see it goes to the bottom. There's holes. Very exciting. Um, yeah, um, I just wanted to show this example. Of, this is a mix of different recycled materials. Um, so this is a, the urban farm um, on one of the rooftops of Boston Medical Center. Um, which is a nice um, service that they have for patients and they grow some of the food for the cafeteria and for their own food pantry. Um, so it's like obviously a pretty different setup than what you have at your house, but I thought it was cool. They have these square fabric containers like the ones I showed before um, and they're wrapped around milk crates um, and those are the more rigid. And so they're very modular. You can move these around a lot and um yeah they're typically big enough to grow it's like a little small for tomatoes i don't even no they definitely grow tomatoes but um you know big enough for you know i guess they even grow two kale plants it's pretty but i would say one or two kale plants in each one or two one or two peppers or one tomato in each container and then they have this really fancy irrigation system which is all the tubes um so that it gets watered regularly. But um, the farmer there said this system works really well. Um, so um, yeah, it's a cool idea. Um, and then this is Oasis Urban Farm in Dorchester, Oasis on Baloo. And you can see in the background, um, these little like lumpy, <laughs> These are bags, these are grow bags, similar fabric. It's a little different than the other model. It's like, looks like a sausage and then you kind of cut a hole where you want to plant things. Um, and it's not that deep, but it is long. So there's room for roots to spread. And um, um, Apollo, who's the 
farmer there grows largely in these bags and I'm impressed at how well things grow in them. And then you avoid a lot of weeds and, and they're not growing in ground. So um, I've never seen any home gardeners using those, but it's pretty interesting. Yeah, so that's containers. I'm gonna talk about soil after this. Um, does any, is there any like pressing questions? At the moment, doesn't seem like it. Um, well, we'll hopefully have a little time at the end. Um, all right, so, oops, okay. Soil, so um, specifically for containers, um, the, especially the smaller containers, you wanna use potting soil. So compost, ideally compost-based potting soil. Um, potting soil has um, some components in it like perlite, um, peat or coconut core that help with aeration basically, which is less of an issue in in-ground, but um, is something that's pretty important. Um, there's also like some, the, the perlite too, you know, has some water retention capacity too. Um, but mostly the, the like fluffiness, you think of potting soil, you think of fluffy soil. Um, coast of Maine, not like the state, um, or Vermont compost are some of the best, comp, you know, commercial compost producers in the region. And you can often um, see, especially Coast of Maine is pretty widely available in hardware stores. Um, but, you know, any compost based potting soil works, you can make your own. Um, and then, for raised beds, um, you're gonna not need, because raised beds, if you think of raised beds as somewhere in between a container and in-ground, you could probably do um, less potting soil, or honestly, I've just had success with a compost loam mix directly in the in the raised bed. Um, you don't need quite as, as fluffy a potting soil. So that's something to consider. Um, another thing that um, is a challenge with container gardening is you, you, the soil doesn't last indefinitely. You do have to restock up on your soil um, because it's not as living an environment as in ground gardening. Um, so you have to replace like a third or a half, you know, top it off, maybe, you know, take a little out and put some new um, potting soil in um, at the, you know, at the beginning of every year. Um, and you probably will want to fertilize like once, twice, at least a year, um, especially as you're planting. And then maybe once the plant is more established and maybe more often than that, um, because they're not necessarily, you know, there's not as much, you know, microorganisms or worms or other things living in your pot as there are in, in ground soil. So um, all those are considerations because um, you're basically making your own soil. Oh, what fertilizer? Um, that's a great question. Um, so oh, why am I blanking on the name? What is it called? Like Neptune's Harvest? Um, what's it called again, Michelle? It's a fish, it's a fish emulsion. So it's kind of smelly, um, but it uh, has a lot of like the, the inherent, um, the sort of the nutrients you need and some of the minerals you need. So um, they, they come in in different ratios of NPK. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are like three core um, elements that you need um, in your soil for plants to grow. A lot of people think of nitrogen mostly, um, but actually, you know, potassium and phosphorus are, are, are also very important. So actually like typically a higher PK ratio to N can be useful, especially for growing fruit. So nitrogen is a lot of the vegetative growth and then fruit is often more phosphorus. Um, so, and that's why compost actually has a ton of phosphorus in it. And so, um, so yeah, so the ne Neptune's harvest. That's right, Neptune's harvest. I don't know why my brain is just not working, but um, yeah, it's pretty widely available. I think Michelle's probably um, can maybe send a link or something, but usually if you look it up, I think we're, we're, are we selling some at City News, Michelle? We are, yeah. So um, if you don't want to buy a whole bottle, because um, it's, it's generally concentrated, and then you can, 
basically they, they explain on the bottle, but you, you put um, a small amount maybe in a watering can um, and then fill it with water and you can use it as like your watering. Um, and so if you don't want a whole amount, we sell sort of smaller amounts um, or a large amount, I mean. And then um, you, it also can work as a foliar fertilizer. So you can actually add it to the leaves and the leaves will take in um, some of that fertilizer too. But you don't wanna overdo it with fertilizer in general because it can burn the leaves. Um, so it's all a balance, but yeah, that's definitely um, a great recommendation. And then um, we have some also um, starting blends. Um, trying to remember, um, Pro Grow. Um, yeah, we're gonna have Pro Grow and Pro Start, I think. Pro -Grow or maybe just Pro, Pro Grow for sale, because that's really better for gardening. Right, so that's a good thing to add as you're like digging your hole and putting your transplant in, for instance. Um, and also has a similar ratio um, just to get your plant started. So that's less like a liquid that you're pouring on directly and more it's gonna break down in the soil and become accessible. Um, but typically fertilizer, especially nitrogen is water soluble. So it's like not the kind of thing that you add three months before you put your plant in and then let break down. It's the kind of thing that you add right when you want to fertilize your plant um, to be very, it's very accessible in the moment type of thing. Um, but good question. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I showed the picture of the raised bed um, with the trellis, but you can trellis in containers. I think that um, bag, that line of um, bag containers had some trellises in it. These um, tomato cages can work because they are sort of circular. And so that often works for the circular container. Or you can make these um, TP type structures, either with stakes you get at a hardware store, or honestly, if you just go find larger, relatively straight branches, those can work really well. Um, don't have to, you can go forage for them in the woods or something. Um, and then you want to get twine or string to wrap around. And those can be great for cucumbers, for tomatoes, for peas, um, beans, anything that likes to climb. Um, and it's fairly simple. I like to show this picture of a trellis that's sort of half out and half in. And I sort of built a ladder of string on the right as the cucumbers grew. So just different ideas of, of how you can build trellises that interact with your containers. So here are some peas. This is a different model. Like a lot of plants will actually just like twirl, you know, climb up a string like that. So it looks like those are peas. And then there's just strings that were tied to the top of the container. Um, so maybe there's little holes in the container and they put a loop around the edge of the container. I thought that was, that was nice. And then um, this is sort of four stakes um, or five even that build sort of a, a you know, a sort of, a sort of ring around sort of a homemade tomato cage. Um, and you can, and you can sort of string the tomatoes, make little uh, horizontal lines of string for the for the different um, branches of the tomato to rest on. And then here's um, some more built in sort of fence like trellises. Um, hey Annabelle, I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you mind just um, trying to speak up a little or enunciate a little bit or come closer to your mic? Someone can. Sure. Here, am I, I'm closer. Is that better? I think so. Thanks. Um, so yeah, we're nearing the end. Um, so trellises. So there are, yeah, so there are some crops that do particularly well in containers. Um, for instance, uh, I mentioned earlier lettuces and, and especially mixed greens, sort of those small greens or arugula, things that you would sort of sprinkle seed, um, going back to those water bottles kind of far back. Um, yeah, these, the idea of sort of smaller baby lettuces can do well in containers. They have pretty shallow roots and um, don't need that much space. Um, and then the, the nightshades, the peppers, tomatoes, and eggplant actually do quite well and sometimes even better in containers because they like to be really hot and they can tolerate drying out a little bit more than some other plants. And so those are often ones that I recommend for growing in containers. Um, 
you know, you can grow one that's probably a three gallon container with a pepper plant seems to be doing nice, nicely. Um, and then, yeah, so probably three gallon for peppers and eggplant would be enough. And then you probably want a five gallon bucket for tomatoes. And the peppers and eggplant will do better in a bigger container. Um, it, it does depend on um, the particular variety that we, you know, for instance, I know Michelle mentioned earlier with our seedling cell, we, we do sell some patio varieties. I haven't found they do super well, but they are like, they are suited for smaller containers. Um, definitely for tomatoes, the recommendation. So there are determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. Determinant tomatoes have a determined height that's usually a bit shorter. Um, and indeterminate will just grow forever. And so typically for container gardening, you want determinate tomatoes. So determinate tomatoes typically do quite well um, in a container. Um, so um, and and on our in our catalog, for instance, we do often mention if they are well suited for containers. Um, but that being said, um, cherry tomatoes are indeterminate, but they are very you know like people do grow them in containers, and um, and it does kind of make sense on a smaller scale to pickle those tiny tomatoes. So so anything's possible. Um, the reality is like for the peppers and eggplant and tomatoes, the bigger container you give them, the more. Um, fruit you're going to get. Um, so that is um, sort of a trade-off at the beginning. I don't know if you can hear my dog snoring in the background, but it's very loud. Um, and yeah, patio varieties are the sort of more compact varieties that might be suited for containers. Um, so percurbits are squash, cucumbers, um, melons, but typically cucumbers especially can do very well in containers. And like you saw, have some trellis kind of um, structure for them to climb up. It can be a nice, compact, um, very productive environment. Um, and so that's a great option. And even other, just some of those more like climbing or reaching um, curcurbits like um, different um, summer or winter squashes, like if you have a big bucket for them to grow in, um, they can spread out, um, you know, outside of the bucket. It doesn't have to all be, you know, the 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 uh, stem of the plant can go beyond the bucket. Um, so that's something to consider. But you do probably want a pretty large bucket for one plant, and that's similarly like bang for your buck. Like if you really want nice sized squash or or cucumbers, it's worth investing in a five gallon bucket and really just putting like one plant in there, maybe two cucumber plants in a five gallon bucket. Um, but really like giving that one plant a really investing in that is going to mean they're going to grow nice fruits. And then herbs. I mean, herbs are really flexible and you don't need them to be in particularly large containers. Um, so rosemary, thyme, basil, they are also a little bit um, more tolerant of drying out um, and they like to be warmer. Um, rosemary and thyme um, and basil to some capacity can be brought in in the winter and can be treated like an indoor plant and sometimes made to survive throughout the winter and then brought back out. Um, mint is a, another herb that's good in containers and a lot of people put mint in the container even if they're growing in ground because mint can take over as well as oregano can really take over in your garden. Um, so it's actually sometimes useful to have in a container. Um, mint can be finicky in a container. It's sort of hard to say whether or not it's gonna work, um, but it's also a very resilient plant. So usually it's, it works pretty well. It's just, it can, it can be sad to be contained. Um, potatoes, I mentioned before, in bags. Um, peas can work. Peas could work in, the, in that more shallow type container. Um, they don't have super deep roots, but they will benefit from a trellis. Um, and then, yeah, I would open it up to the group. Um, I would love to like hear if, um, if people have had success with other, um, other varieties or other plants that have worked well. Um, I wanna share just like maybe, oh, that's it, yes. Oh no, this was, oops. There was one more picture that I want to share, talking about indeterminate tomatoes. 
Um, this was another mug, muggle, as they're called, uh, master urban gardener um, who grew, you can't really see the bottom that well, but these are indeterminate tomatoes and you can see they're just growing forever. And this is on her, you know, on her balcony. Um, she has very large containers. I don't know if you can tell, they're, they're, they're probably like 10 or 12 gallon, if not more. Um, but it seems like maybe there's even more than one plant in there. Um, but they are prolific. So never say never. I guess she sort of strung them up along the, the wall of the porch or has something hanging from above. Um, but yeah, good inspiration. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if anyone, you, you're welcome to unmute yourself and share if you have any varieties. that have worked for you. How, um, yeah, and I'm just looking over the chat a bit. Um, I wanna look at the kinds of Neptune's harvest. I usually would recommend the higher potassium. What's the orange one? Two, three, one is pretty good. The blue one, fish seaweed blend. Um, oops, I'm just <laughs> sharing my screen. Um, then there were other questions. Do you prune cherry tomatoes? You can, you can definitely prune cherry tomatoes. It makes it a little easier to manage. Um, it's, yeah. It's sort of, but you don't want to overdo it. So yeah, I think to some extent it's useful. Um, and it depends what your setup is, like how tall they're going to be able to get. Like that, you know, like that setup I just showed you, it could get almost indefinitely, not indefinitely tall, but it could get to be like 12, 13 feet. Whereas typically if you're growing in a pot, you're not going to get that tall. Um, so the rabbit's question, um, did I? have a picture of that. Maybe I didn't include that particular picture, but going back to the, um, I guess, from containers, um, I guess, Tacey, what um, kind of container are you thinking about growing in, I guess, is my question. I mean, pro probably a five, five gallon container, um, but I just, I have a big rabbit problem here, so yeah, um, I, I mean, honestly, I, I have found that like the five gallon container is sometimes tall enough that it deters them. Um, I don't know if you've had that experience, but you could try putting um, a little bit of chicken wire around the edge of a, a edge of your bucket or something mm -hmm. kind of sharp run. I mean, it just makes it harder for you to manage, but um, it could be it could be a deterrent, like basically wrap it around. Um, <clears throat> or just make them, yeah, make them a little bit higher or hard to get to. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a little tougher with the smaller containers, but I think there is some potential for building a sort of small fence around the edges of your containers. I, I remember trying to do that with some smaller containers with leftover. We had a lot of chicken wire because we used to have chickens and it's pretty annoying to deal with yourself <laughs> if it's sharp, um, but it can do the trick. Like we built a little fence around some of our smaller raised beds with some posts and then, but like if it's just a, yeah. How often do you use fertilizer? So yeah, it can depend, like not that, I mean, I personally don't use it that often, probably a little bit once they get started and then definitely at some point, maybe three times, you know, over the course of the rest of the season might be an appropriate amount. I have a soil pile from my backyard garden in Boston. Um, wait, what do you, um, Christina, what do you mean you have a, a soil pile? Like you got it from elsewhere? Hey, uh, hi. So I have a pile from just moving soil around from my backyard or my front yard. So I just keep everything. I kind of dump everything back there into the soil pile. 
Uh, it also it might include soil from like discarded pots and plants and things like that. Um, and have you gotten a soil test on your yard? No, I have not. So yeah, I would be hesitant to use that before you, you make sure that that soil is safe to use. And then the problem with the discarded soil the from pots is often it has lost a lot of its nutrient value. Um, so it can be a good um, addition to compost or if you wanna start a worm bin, those are some, you know, it's a good base for that. But it, you know, it might be something that you just like put in a different part of your yard. It's not gonna be as useful for growing very productive. Um, container garden plants. And then from the soil with your yard, if you are starting a container garden, it, it is definitely worth being sure, you know, if your soil doesn't have lead or, or something like that in it. Um, yeah, you. I might try to show, well, I mean, does anyone have any other questions? I might, I might try to show, I might yeah. try to show. Um, Annabelle, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I like to grow summer squash and they grow too large for my eight by four raised bed. So I'm wondering how large a container I should use to grow them. In yeah, a I will. Okay, so if my Wi-Fi can work um, to my yard, I will show you a good size container. But I think a five gallon or honestly, even a little bigger. Um, so I keep using the five gallon bucket as sort of a reference. But there are, you know, like if you go to a garden, there are containers meant for gardening purposes that that uh, that are a little bit a little bit shorter and squatter and they're probably more like eight gallons um, and you could probably grow two or so squash plants depending is this oh summer squash so zucchini or something like that yes yeah so those are a little bit more bushy mm -hmm. you could maybe grow two smaller ones or one big one in there it also depends on like how committed are you to having really long large full-size plants, or if you'd rather, you know, try to sneak in an extra plant and not be as, you know, sort of perfectionist about it. Um, but, you know, one, one thing I will say is sometimes it's worth getting an extra plant or two in case one of your plants dies. So like planting two zucchini, if like one dies, then you have a backup. But beyond the sort of initial point of planting and that transition, um, it's worth investing in fewer plants um, than having a ton and you know I think that's a very typical container gardening mistake is that you just cram in all these plants into a pot and then they all are just like this big and you don't really get any sizable squash mm -hmm. um so yeah I would say like quite a quite a decent size and then you will really have a productive squash but okay thank you chicken wire yeah oh I don't know anything about the fish water that's really interesting Oh, and then Hannah actually answered. That's exciting. Yeah, I have I have seen the hydroponics, but it's it's the kind of hydroponics where the, I, there was a system where, yeah, I guess it was just there were certain fish and it was in a tank beneath the beneath the garden bed and there was some kind of cycling that was happening. So I guess you probably want to pay attention to what kind of fish and it seems like make sure your nitrates aren't too high. Um, and yeah, the chemicals, that's a good point, Michelle. All right, so I'm gonna try to do it for, and if, I, uh, if it disconnects, I'll just come right back. Oh, it got so beautiful out. Um, here's some of my dead plants that I haven't really started from last year. Here's a really nice long uh, window box. So just an example of something and it just like sits really nicely on my on my sort of porch here. Um, this is chives. The soil level is quite low, which is not super ideal, but you can see this is uh, maybe two gallon or something um, container. Um, and so the chives are doing nice nice in here. This is a really great container container plant chives. They will survive anything. Um, so and they come back every year. So that's a really nice option. Um, you can do it even in a slightly smaller container like this size. Um, you can often use the containers like these are just containers from nurseries, you know, that are ready to go. They're a little bit thinner plastic and flimsy. 
And then um, often these aluminum pie tins are a good way to, you know, if you don't want to ruin the wood underneath to trap the water. This is the mint plant. Um, it's in a pretty big container. I do find mint does better in, I've tried it in the window box and it, it sometimes likes that and it sometimes finds it too shallow. They're finicky. The mint's starting to come back. So yeah, it did pretty well in this last year. So yeah, and then these were ceramic pots. Usually would recommend putting them in the basement so that they don't crack, but oh, this one was actually inside and I took it out because the plant died. <laughs> I tried to overwinter. Um, I think it was a thyme plant, but here's some nice ceramic pots. Those are good for herbs. That's a nice thing. There was parsley in here. It definitely is totally dead. So that'll be something. So I might use some of this soil again. You can see it has like the, the perlite or vermiculite in it, the little white dots. Um, I might use some of the soil, like leave a decent amount at the bottom, but um, put some more in the top to, to fill it out. And then, yeah, even these small containers can work. You can put a couple of flowers in there or a smaller herb, um, something like that. Um, maybe a basil, a basil plant. <laughs> Actually, basil does well in this kind of uh, long window box type of thing. Um, you can do a nice row of basil and that'll last you all, all, uh, all summer. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to see if I can stretch this Wi-Fi. So, yeah. So some more containers. This is a big bucket example. Um, this you could grow a couple of different things in. Um, you could probably grow two tomatoes if you wanted or a tomato and a, and a couple other things. Um, you'd need to drill a hole in the bottom. Um, I did that with a different one. These were from one of our corporate sites. Um, and you, know, you might actually need a drill for something this rigid, but these are really nice and durable. Um, so that's, that's an option, but it will require a lot of soil like probably like two full bags of soil. So that's something to consider. Annabelle, this can I ask you a question? Oops. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, um, I know when we plant in our community garden uh, tomatoes, we plant marigolds with them. Would you do that in a pot with tomatoes? Definitely, yeah. I So yeah, I've grown, so these containers, I was a school gardener when I was in food court for whoever's in the food court, food court person. Um, and we would grow in containers like this, probably even a little bigger. Um, and then we grow a tomato and then we'd actually have like a couple of basil or some marigolds around the edge. So um, if you're using one of those um, five gallon buckets, they're, they're pretty narrow. Um, so you might not be able to do much, but you could probably speak a marigold or two because the marigolds are one of those things that has a shallow root. But if it's too narrow, you might just, the tomato might sh um, shade it out a little too much, but I think that's a nice, a nice, a nice mix with the okay. wider containers. Like this is a planter that's a bit wider, um, a little bit more soil than the. This is two buckets. I can't separate them. Um, um, it's a little bit wider and has more more volume, um, but not by much. And this is a really nice thing for squash or something that's going to sort of spill out. Um, and this is a thing where you could grow a tomato and then a couple other things because a little wider, like some small things, like not don't put like a pepper in it as well, but but you could put some some marigolds for sure. Okay. Yeah, that'd be nice. Okay, thanks. Or I, uh, that picture that I shared had some alyssum, which is sort of like a ground crawling flower that might work. Um, and then this is the raised bed. I just want to show you. Um, I was inspired to build this. For the end of the season, but for season extension frame, and as you can tell, but um, the sides of this are diagonal. Ugh, can't really tell. Basically, the top is like a little bit, a couple inches taller than the bottom. And there's a old window pane. There's two 
that fit on this bed and you can put hinges on the edge and then basically use it as a, a lid um, so that in the beginning and end of the season, you can start growing things. Um, but I've been just using it as a raised bed for the time being. Um, so that's, that's an option. And this is like a nice little raised bed. It wasn't a big commitment. I think it's like two and a half by five feet. Um, and you can grow a decent amount of food in it. Um, I like it and definitely to easily reach it. Um, and then here's some strawberries. I don't actually know if they're gonna stay in this pot, but I was just overwintering them. Probably should move them. Um, yeah. Those are some container things. Um, flowers will do really well in containers. You can even grow bulbs in containers. I'm just gonna relocate and people have any last questions. Or if you even want to share things that you've experimented with that have worked. I have large containers on my roof. What I find is so fun is I actually have a different growing zone. Tropical peppers will do well. Yeah, so that I had that experience with that cement raised bed, not on a roof, but it was in a southern facing backyard lot. And it was so warm, things did so well there. It is really nice to experiment. You definitely can have different microclimates with your container gardening, depending on how sheltered it is and yeah, how much the asphalt heats it up. Um, so that is a really nice, a nice component. Very cool. Any last questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you all so much for coming and we hope to see you at um, all of our upcoming workshops. We have a lot of, of relevant, you know, once you have your containers all set up, you know, um, just some vegetable gardening 101, high yield gardening, um, there's a bunch of different options um, to check out coming up. And we have some kids programming um, that will be also both virtual and in person. And so definitely look at our website. Our Facebook page is a great place to see updated information. And yeah, it was great. It was great talking to y'all. <laughs>